Okay. Hi, everybody. Let's get started. So um, it's been a while since we uh, came together in a lecture. Last week, we had the holiday, we had the midterm. Um, so uh, with that, um, where what have we been doing? Um, we finished the first half of the course, um, you know, about two weeks ago, where we talked about we were talking about computability theory. We have shifted into the second half, talking about complexity theory. Um, so get your mind uh, back to that. Uh, we um, discussed the various different models um, and, and, and ways of measuring uh, complexity on different models, um, at least in terms of the amount of time that's used. And in the end, we settled on the one tape Turing machine, which is the same model we had been working with in the first half of the course, and argued that um, though they're, the measures of complexity are gonna differ somewhat from model to model, they're not gonna matter uh, differ by more than a polynomial amount. And so uh, since the kinds of questions we're gonna be asking uh, are going to be um, basically whether problems are polynomial or not, uh, it's not gonna really matter uh, which model we pick uh, among reasonable deterministic models. And so we're gonna, the one tape Turing machine is a reasonable choice. Uh, given that we defined uh, time complexity classes, the time T of N classes, we defined the class P which was invariant among all of those different model deterministic models in the sense that it didn't matter which model we choose, we were gonna end up with the same class P. So that argues for its naturalness. Um, and we gave an example of this path problem being in P. And we kind of ended that lecture uh, before the midterm with the discussion of this Hamiltonian path problem. So we're gonna come back to that today. Uh, so today we're gonna to look at non-deterministic complexity, uh, define the, the classes non-deterministic time or n time, uh, talk about the class NP, the P versus NP problem, which is one of the you know, very famous unsolved problems in our field, and uh, look at dynamic programming, one of the most basic algorithm, polynomial time algorithms and polynomial time reducibility, moving toward our discussion of NP completeness, uh, which we will begin um, next lecture. So with that, uh, let's move into today's uh, uh, content, uh, which is, um, well, just a quick review. We, uh, as I mentioned, we define the time complexity class. This is a, the time complexity class is a collection of languages. The languages that you can do, um, these are a collection of languages. All of the languages that you can solve in a certain amount of, a certain time bound within a certain amount of time. So to the, the time, the time n squared, for example, is all of the, the pro, all of the languages or all of the problems that you can solve in n squared time. We're identifying problems with languages here. And the class P is the collection of all problems that you can solve or all languages that you can solve in polynomial time. So it's the union over all time n to the k. So n squared, n cubed, n to the fifth power, and so on. Um, union out of all that, all, all of those bounds, um, the, the associated language, languages, that's the class P. And um, we gave an example of this path problem. We gave an algorithm for path. Um, and then we introduced this Hamiltonian path problem. Um, so if you remember, um, instead of just asking, given a graph, whether you can get from S to T, now we wanna know, can I, get from S to T, but visit every other node along the way. Um, so find a, um, a path that goes through everything else um, and gets from S to T. Um, and uh, uh, I should say it's also, it's a simple path. So you're only allowed to, to go through every node just once. Um, and now, um, uh, um, the question is for this problem is that, can we solve that problem in polynomial time? The, you know, can we somehow modify the algorithm for path to give us an algorithm that solves Hamiltonian path in polynomial time? Of course we could solve Hamiltonian path with an exponential algorithm by trying all possible paths. Um, and that will give a correct algorithm, but it, uh, 
there are exponentially many different paths and trying them all will not give a polynomial time algorithm. So the interesting problem is, can we solve that without doing that brute force searching through all possible paths? Um, and uh, that's a problem that no one knows the answer to. Um, despite lots of effort, people have not succeeded in finding an algorithm for that. But um, on the other hand, we don't have any idea how to prove there is no such algorithm. Um, I mean, it's conceivable that one could prove such a thing, but we just don't know how to do it. And so um, uh, that problem is an unsolved problem. And I just want, this isn't really a note to myself. Um, uh, what's kind of amazing, and this is what we're gonna be showing over the next few lectures, that there, are, there, would, there would be very surprising consequences if you could find a way to solve Hamiltonian path in polynomial time. Because what that would immediately yield is a polynomial time way of say factoring large numbers or solving a, a large number of other problems that we don't, don't know how to solve in polynomial time. So, you know, as we mentioned, you know, factoring um, is a problem where we, that we only know at present how to solve with an exponential algorithm. Um, and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the fact with the Hamiltonian path problem. It seemed very different, but yet, if you can solve Hamiltonian path in polynomial time, then you can factor numbers in polynomial time. And so we'll see how to make that connection. Um, uh, that, that's what we're building toward with the next uh, few lectures. Okay. Um, so happy to take any comments on comments and questions on that, or we'll just move on um, if you have any questions on, on our little review. Well, Send questions along, and we can stop at the end of, uh, you know, various slides to 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 try to answer them, or and of course write to the TAs um, who can take your questions during during while I'm lecturing. Okay, um, so to start this off, we're going to have to talk about uh, non-deterministic complexity as a variation of deterministic complexity. So first of all, when we have a all of our all of our, the machines in this part of the course and the languages, everything is going to be decidable, and all the machines are going to be deciders. So, what do we mean when we have a non-deterministic machine, which a decider is a decider? And that just simply means that all of the branches, it's not just the machine halts on every input, but all of the branches halt on every input. You know, so the non-deterministic machine is non-deterministic; it has lots of possible branches. They all have to halt, all of them on every input. That's what makes a non-deterministic machine a decider. And you can convert a non-deterministic decider into a deterministic decider. But the question is how much time would that introduce? How much extra time is that gonna cost? And the only way that people know at the present time for that conversion would be uh, to do an exponential increase, um, basically to try all possible branches. And that's of course very slow. So um, let's first, let's understand what we mean by the time used by a non-deterministic machine. And what we mean by the time used is we're looking at the each individual branch individually, uh, separately. Um, so a non-deterministic machine will say runs in a certain amount of time if all of the branches halt within that amount of time. So you you know what we do we we do not mean that the total amount of usage the total amount of effort by adding up all the branches is at most t of n. It's just that each branch individually uses at most t of n. That's just going to be our definition, and it's going to turn out to be uh, the the right way to look at this um, to get something useful. Um, um, so um, uh, if we have, um, so now we're gonna define the analogous uh, complexity class associated to uh, non-deterministic computation, which we'll call non-deterministic time. So non-deterministic time T of N is the set of all languages that you can do with a non-deterministic machine that runs in order T of N time. Um, just think back to the definition we had for deterministic 
uh, complexity, the time class, or sometimes people call it D time to emphasize the difference, but let's just say we're, we're calling it in this course time versus N time. So time T of N is all of the languages that you can do with a one tape Turing machine uh, that's deterministic, um, but this here is a non-deterministic Turing machine for non-deterministic time. Um, so the picture th that, uh, uh, that is good to have in your head here um, would be, uh, if you think of non-determinism in terms of a computation tree, thinking of all the different branches of the non-determinism, um, all of those branches have to halt and they have to halt within the time bound. So imagine here, this is T of n time. All of the branches have to halt within T of n steps for this, a non-deterministic Turing machine to be running in T of n time and to be doing a language in the n time T of n class. Um, and by analogy with what we did before, the class NP is the um, uh, collection of all languages that you can do non-deterministically in polynomial time. Um, so it's the union over all of the end time classes uh, where we the bound is polynomial. Um, okay, so uh, a lot of this should look very familiar, but we've just added a bunch of non-deterministics and a bunch of ends in, in place, but the definitions are very similar. Um, and one of the motivations we had for looking at P, the class P was that it did not depend um, on the choice of model, as long as the model was deterministic and reasonable. And this is also, the class NP is also gonna not depend on the choice of model, as long as it's a reasonable non-deterministic uh, model. So um, it's again, a very natural class to look at from a mathematical standpoint. And it also captures something uh, interesting kind of from, from a practical standpoint, which we're gonna talk about over the next couple of fly, slides, which is that it captures the problems where you can easily verify when you're a member of the language. Okay, so we'll talk about that. But um, you know, if you take, for example, the Hamiltonian path problem, when you find a member of the language, so that is a graph that does have a Hamiltonian path from S to T, you can easily verify that's true by simply exhibiting the path. Not all problems can be solved, can be verified in that way. But the problems that are in NP have that special feature that you, when you have a member of the language, there's a way to verify that you're a member. So we're gonna talk about that because um, that's really the key to understanding NP, this notion of verification. Okay, so let me go, there was a good question here. Let me just see if I want to answer that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, this is a little bit of a long, longer question that I, I, I want to fully respond to, but you mean the, the well, let's turn to my next slide, which may be sort of bring that out anyway. Um, actually, it's a couple of slides from now, but I'll, I'll get to that point. Um, so let's look at Hamiltonian, the hand path problem. And what I'm, what I'm gonna show is the Hamiltonian path problem is in NP. And I'm gonna walk you through this one kind of slowly. Um, so the Hamiltonian path problem, and remember, we don't know if it's in P, but it is in NP. So it's in one of these, you can solve Hamiltonian path in polynomial time if you're a non-deterministic machine. Um, why is that? Well, it's because of the non-determinism uh, it, because of the parallelism of non-determinism, um, which allows you to kind of to check all of the paths on different branches. So let me first describe how the algorithm, how I would just, how I would write down the algorithm, and then we'll kind of try to unpack that and understand how that actually looks in terms of the Turing machine, or the Turing machine's computation. So first of all. So taking the Hamiltonian path problem, you know, you're given an input now, which is a graph and the nodes S and T where I'm trying to figure out is the Hamiltonian path, again, which visits all the nodes, which takes you from S to T. Um, 
And um, we're trying to make now a non-deterministic machine, which is going to accept all such inputs which have a path. So the way this non-deterministic uh, machine is going to work is it's basically going to use its non-determinism to try all possible paths on the different branches. And the way I'll specify that um, is to say non-deterministically, we're going to write down a candidate path, which is just going to be a sequence of nodes, sequence of M nodes, where we'll say that's the total number of nodes of the graph. Remember, a Hamiltonian path, because it visits every node, is going to be a path with exactly M nodes in it. So I'm going to write down a sequence of nodes as a candidate path. And I'm non-deterministically going to choose every possible sequence in this way. Um, if you like to think of the guessing metaphor for non-determinism, non you can think of the non-deterministic machine as guessing the right path, which is going to be the Hamiltonian path from S to T. But I think from, for this discussion, it might be more helpful to think about all of the different branches of the non-determinism. Um, because that's perhaps more useful when we're thinking about it in terms of the time. You, I think you'll get used to thinking about it. You should be used to thinking about it in many, in many of the different ways, but maybe the computation tree of all branches might be the more helpful one here. So now, as after we write down a sequence, a candidate path, a sequence of nodes, um, now I have to check that this really is a path. And the way I'm going to do that is to say, well, now if I have just a sequence of nodes written down, what does it mean for it to be a Hamiltonian path from S to T? Well, it better start with S and end with T, first of all. And we have to make sure that every step of the way is actually an edge. So each pair VI to VI plus one has to be an edge in the graph. Otherwise that sequence of nodes is not gonna be a legitimate Hamiltonian path from S to T. And you could be, it has to be a simple path. You can't be repeating nodes. These four conditions together will guarantee that we have a Hamiltonian path. And once we have written down a candidate, sequence, we can just check that that sequence actually works. Um, there's no, at this um, second stage of the algorithm, non-determinism isn't necessary. This is going to be a deterministic phase, but the st stage one of the uh, algorithm is going to be a non-deterministic phase where it's writing down all possible paths. Now, I'm going to try to unpack that for you so you can actually visualize how the machine is doing this. Um, and then, of course, you know, so you're going to, on each branch of the non-determinism, you're going to check to see whether the conditions have been satisfied. And on that branch, if the conditions were not satisfied, that branch is going to reject. Of course, one of the other branches might yet accept. So um, that's how non-determinism works. Okay, so I'd like to visualize this. Um, uh, um, I'd like to visualize this as a uh, the tree of uh, of the different branches of the computation of M on its input. So here is the here is our non-deterministic uh, Turing machine, um, uh, which this one, um, and you provide it with the input, uh, you know, G, S, and T. And how does the machine actually working? So when I say non-deterministically write down a sequence of M nodes, you know, you know, this is getting into a little bit more detail, detail than I would normally think about it uh, because we try to tend to think about things at a higher level. But just, for, just to get us started, I think it's good to think about this with a bit more detail. So let's think of the nodes, the M nodes, as being numbered, having labels numbered one through M. And I'm gonna think about them being labeled by their binary sequences. You know, we're gonna write down those nodes. That's how the, you know, the machine is gonna to have to operate on those uh, numbers for the nodes. We'll think about them as being written in binary. 
And now as the machine is going to be writing down, let's say the node V1. So it's non-deterministically picking the first node of the sequence. What does that actually mean in terms of the um, uh, the step-by-step uh, -step processing of the Turing machine M? Well, it's going to be um, guessing via a sequence of non-deterministic moves, the bits that represent the number of the node V for V1. You know, for example, V1 might be the node number five in the graph. Um, because, you know, non-deterministically, the, the machine is on different branches picking all different possible can choices for V1. Those are going to be the different branches here. But, you know, uh, one of the branches might be, uh, and what I'm, what I'm really representing here, these are, uh, I, I probably could have written this down on the slide here in, 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 in tiny font, but these are like the zero one choices. That's why it's sort of a binary tree here for the uh, writing down the bits of, v, uh, uh, of, of V1. So here, maybe this could be one zero one representing uh, the number five, which might be the very first node that I'm writing down in my sequence. Some other branch is going to write down node number six. Some other branch is going to write down node number two. Because non-deterministically, we're making all possible choices for V1. That's what I'm trying to show in this little part of the computation of M on this input. So then after it's uh, finished writing down the description of the node uh, for V1, um, its choice for V1, it goes down to make choose what V2 is, again, non-deterministically. So there's going to be more branches you know, um, for each possible choice of v V2, and so on, node after node. Um, then it's going to finally get to the last node, VM. It's going to write down lots of choices for VM. And at this point here, we have completed uh, the, the first stage of the algorithm. Now, there's some huge tree of all of the possible choices for the Vs that have shown up at this point, okay? And uh, now we're gonna move into the second phase. So following this, there's gonna be um, here a, the, uh, a bunch of uh, deterministic steps of the machine. So no more, non, no more branching, no more branching is needed uh, because here, We've written down at this at this point. We've 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 reached a point in each of these um, uh, at each at each of those locations where we've chosen one of the candidates, one of the possible branches, or one of the possible paths through the machine, um, one of the possible paths through the through the graph. I'm sorry. So we um, you know here we're guessing uh, potential paths in the graph, and now we're going to check that we actually have picked a path that's a Hamiltonian path from S to P, S to T, okay? So each, each one of these uh, branches is now gonna end up accepting or rejecting. And the whole overall computation is going to accept if at least one of them ended up accepting, which means you actually found a Hamiltonian path. Okay, so I don't know if that's helpful to you or not, but um, that is, uh, so we can just, you know, if there's uh, any questions on this, let's see. Um, question on, you know, is there something, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, trying to draw a connection here between this and, and computation histories. Um, I mean, the, the, there is a pattern here that does come up often where you, 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 you want to check something's, you know, starts right, ends right, and that all of the intermediates are right. So there is, I think there, there is a, um, there is some deeper connection here, probably too hard to explain, but um, th that does have something to do with uh, this Hamiltonian path problem. Um, why are we using binary representation? Well, we're going to talk about, um, you know, we, the algorithm would have worked equally well if we used um, base three or base five or base, you know, 20 um, uh, to, as a way of writing down our labels for the nodes, um, but in a sense, it doesn't matter. 
Um, um, the alphabet has to be finite. So that's, that's true. I mean, that's why you, it's not just in a single step of the Turing machine that you would pick the, the node, uh, the, cho the choice for V1. You really have to go through a sequence of steps because each of the branches of the machine only has a fixed number of choices. So you can't, in a single step of the Turing machine, pick all the different possibilities for V1. It has to go through a sequence. Um, okay. Um, now let, let me do a second example. The the problem for of composites. So the 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 language of all composites are all of the non primes, written as binary numbers again. So we'll talk about the base and the and the representation in a second. But just imagine, you know, he, you know, these are all of the numbers that are not prime. Uh, and that language is easily seen to be a member of NP. Uh, here is again the algorithm for that. Um, given X, um, we want to accept X if it's not a prime number. So it has some non-trivial factor. Um, so first, the way the non-deterministic machine is going to work is it's going to guess that factor. So it's not deterministically, it's going to try every possible factor. What, where, why is going to be a number between one and X, but not including one, we, we, you know, that we have to be an interesting factor. So not including one in the number itself. So something strictly in between. And we're going to then, after we've non-deterministically chosen Y, then we're going to test to see if Y um, is really a factor. And we'll, so we'll see if it y divides evenly into x with a remainder of zero. You know, if that branch successfully picked the, the right y, it's going to accept. And some other branch would, might have picked the wrong y will not. And if x is really a composite number, some branch will find the factor. Um, now the base doesn't matter. Could have used base 10. Um, because you can convert from one base to another. Um, so this is really in terms of our representation of the, of the number. But I do want to make one point here that changing, you, you, we don't want to write the number in unary. Um, you know, just as a, writing the number K as a sequence of K1s. Um, that's not really a base. Um, that's just an exponential representation for the number. And that changes the game because if you, make the input exponentially larger, um, then uh, it's gonna change whether the algorithm relative to that exponentially larger input is polynomial or not. Um, so an algorithm that might've been exponential originally in, when the number's written in binary might become polynomial if the number's written in unary. Um, and I do wanna mention as a side note that the composites language uh, or primes for that matter, it doesn't, you know, both are in P, um, but we won't cover that. So uh, whereas the Hamiltonian path problem is not known whether it's in P, the primes and composites problem are uh, in P. Um, so that was known, that was actually a very big result in the field uh, solved um, uh, by folks in at one of the uh, Indian Institutes of Technology uh, back about, uh, you, know, you know, almost 20 years ago now. Um, okay. Um, so let's turn here to trying to get a, an intuitive feeling for P and NP. And we'll talk, we'll return now to this notion of NP corresponding to easy verifiability. So um, NP are the languages where you can easily verify membership quickly. And I'll try to explain what that means. In contrast, P are the languages where you can test membership quickly. Uh, by quickly, I'm, I'm using polynomial time. Um, that's gonna be basically, you know, for us, that's what quickly means in this course. Um, so, in the case of the Hamiltonian path problem, the way you verify the membership is you give the path. 
In the case of the composites, the way you verify the membership is you give the factor. Um, in those two cases, and in general, um, when we have a problem that's in NP, we think of this verification as having a, a giving, a, we give it a special name called a, a certificate or sometimes a short certificate to emphasize the polynomiality of the certificate. It's like a way of proving that you're a member of the language. Um, in the case of composites, the proof is the factor. In the case of ham path, the proof is the, is the path, the Hamiltonian path. Um, contrast that, for example, if you had a prime number. Um, you know, proving a number is composite is easy because you just exhibit the factor. How would you prove that a number is prime? Um, what's, what's the short certificate of um, proving that some number is, it has no factor. That's not so obvious. Um, in fact, there are ways of doing it, which I'm not gonna get into in the case of prime, uh, testing if number is prime, but, and, and now it's even so known to be in P, so that's e even better. But there's no obvious way of proving that a number is prime with a short certificate. Um, and uh, so th this concept of having, being able to verify when you're a member of the language, that's key to understanding NP. That's the intuition you need to develop and hopefully take away from today's lecture or at least you know, by thinking about it and reading the book and so on. Um, so if you compare these two classes, P and NP, uh, P first of all is gonna be a subset of NP, both in terms of the way we defined it because deterministic machines are a special case of non-deterministic machines. Um, but also if you want to think about testing membership, if you can test membership easily, then you can certainly verify it in terms of the, the certificate. You don't even need the certificate is irrelevant at that point because whatever the certificate is, you can still test yourself whether the input is in the, is in the language or not. Um, uh, the big question, as I mentioned, is whether these two classes are the same. So does uh, being able to verify membership uh, quickly, say with one of these certificates, allow you to dispense with the certificate, not even need a certificate and just test it for yourself, whether you're in the language um, and do that you know, in polynomial time. Uh, that, that's the question. For a problem like Hamiltonian path, uh, do you need to search for the answer um, if you're doing it deterministically, or can you somehow uh, not need, you know, avoid that and just come up with the answer directly uh, with a with a with, with a polynomial time solution? The, nobody knows the answer to that, uh, and it goes back at this point quite a long time. It's almost 60 years now um, uh, that um, that problem has been around 60 years. No, that would be 50 years. No, 50 years, almost 50 years. Um, so um, the uh, most people believe that P is different from NP. In other words, that there are problems in P that are in NP, which are not in P. Um, the candidate would be the Hamiltonian path problem. Uh, but it seems to be very hard to prove that. Um, uh, and part of the reason is, I mean, how do you prove that's a, a problem like Hamiltonian path does not have a polynomial time algorithm. Um, it's very tricky to do that because the class of polynomial time algorithms is a very rich class. Polynomial time algorithms are very powerful. And to try to prove there's no clever way of solving the Hamiltonian path problem, it just seems to be beyond our present day mathematics. Um, I believe someday somebody's gonna solve it, but uh, so far, no one has succeeded. Um, so what I thought we would do is, I think I have a check in here. Uh, yes. And then we'll stop for a break. So let's look at the, the complementary problem, hand path complement. Um, so that's, you're in the language now, if you don't have a path. Um, so is that complementary problem in NP? Okay, so 
for that to be the case, we would need to have short certificates of when a graph does not have um, a Hamiltonian path. So I leave it to you. So there are three choices. Um, okay. I'm gonna stop here. So make sure you get your participation credit here. Um, I'm gonna end, end the polling now. Interesting, so <laughs> the majority is wrong. Well, I don't know, wrong, we don't know. Uh, the, the, you know, um, the, uh, I, I think the only fair answer to this question is C, is C. Um, because we don't know uh, whether or not we can give short certificates for a graph not to have a Hamiltonian path. If, if P equaled NP, then you can test in polynomial time whether a graph has a Hamiltonian path. And then the computation itself would be a certificate whether it has a path or whether it doesn't have a path because it would be something that you can check easily. Um, so uh, since we don't know uh, for sure that P is different from NP, um, you know, P could be equal to NP, then it's possible that um, uh, we, can, we could give a short certificate, um, namely the computation of the polynomial algorithm. Um, so the only really um, uh, uh, reasonable answer to this question is that we don't know. Uh, so uh, just uh, ponder that. I think the, 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 the thing that um, you, those of you who answered yes, however, um, need to go back and, and I put this here explicitly because I know this is a this, this, this is a confusion for, well, I can see for quite a few of you. Um, um, when we have non-deterministic computation, uh, you have a non-deterministic machine, you can't sim simply invert the answer and get back a non-deterministic machine. Non-determinism does not work that way. Uh, if you remember, you know, the, the complement of a pushdown automaton um, is not a pushdown automaton. Uh, if you have a non-deterministic machine and you invert all of the responses on each of the branches, um, it's not going to be um, recognizing or deciding the complementary language. Uh, so, um, because, well, I, I think that this is something you, you if you answered yes, you need to go back and make sure you understand why yes um, is is not a is not a reasonable answer to this question uh, because that, that's not how non-determinism works. So you have a um, a, a not complete understanding of non-determinism, and that's going to be really important for us going forward. So th I, I really urge you to figure out and understand why yes is not a is not a good answer to this uh, to this check-in. Okay, so I think we will. Um, we can talk about that more over the over the break, um, and so uh, we'll we'll return here in um, in five minutes. Somebody's asking about inf you know infinite uh, infinite sequences be generated by the machine. Um, I you know when we're talking about. Um, you know, it's especially in the complexity section of the course, all of the computations are gonna be uh, bounded in time. So we're not going to be thinking about sort of infinite runs of the machine. That's not gonna be relevant for us. So um, let's not think about that. How does the Turing machine perform division? Um, how does a Turing machine perform division? Well, uh, how do you perform division? <laughs> Uh, the long division is a is an, an operation that can run in, you know, uh, the, the the long division procedure that you you learn in a grade school can you can implement that on a Turing machine. Um, so yes, a Turing machine can definitely perform do long division or division of in, one integer by another in in a polynomial time. Um, Okay, another question. Can we generally say, try dividing y by x, or do we have to enumerate a string of length y and cross off every, no, I think that's the same question. 
you know, I mean, how would, you know, if you have numbers written in binary, how would you do the division? You're not going to uh, use long division. Um, you know, anything such as the, the, the thing that's proposed here uh, by, by the, the questioner is going to be an exponential algorithm. So don't do it that way. Um, uh, uh, why does primes in P not, um, composites in P not imply primes in P? It does imply, if, if composites are in P, then primes is in P as well because you can just, you know, when you have a deterministic machine, you can flip the answer. When you have a non-deterministic machine, you may not be able to flip the answer. So a de deterministic machine, just having a single branch, um, you can make another deterministic machine that runs in the same amount of time that does the complementary language. Um, because um, for deterministic machines, um, just like for deciders um, in, the, in the computability section, you can just invert the answer. Uh, there, there is an analogy here between P and decidability and NP and recognizability. It's not a airtight analogy here, but there is some relationship there. Um, what are the implications? Somebody's asking me the implications of P equal to NP. Lots of implications. Um, too long to enumerate now, but for example, uh, you would be able to break basically all crypto systems um, that I'm aware of if P equaled NP. So we would have a lot of consequences. Um, Someone's asking, so composites, primality and compositeness testing is solvable in polynomial time, but factoring, interestingly enough, is not known to be solvable in polynomial time. Uh, so that, I mean, that, so, so um, we may talk about this a little bit toward the end of the term if we have time, but uh, the algorithms for testing whether a number is prime or composite in polynomial time do not operate by looking for factors. They operate in an entirely different way. Um, basically by showing that a number is prime or composite by looking at certain properties of that number, but without testing whether it has uh, testing but without finding a factor. Um, uh, okay, another question here about asking um, the, uh, when we talk about encodings, do we have to say how we encode numbers, values? No, we don't have to, we usually don't get, have to get into uh, spelling out encodings. Um, as long as they're reasonable encodings. Um, so you don't have to, usually, we're gonna be talking about things at a higher enough level that the specific encodings are not gonna matter. Um, okay, let's, let's return to our, uh, the rest of our lecture. When we talk about, um, uh, say this P versus NP problem, and how do you show that uh, you know, a problem might not be solvable in, in P, like the Hamiltonian path problem? Um, you know, many people you, you know, who are not uh, practitioners in the field um, you know, are, know, about the P versus, know, know about the P versus NP problems. I, I've, over the years, I've gotten many, many emails and, 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 and physical letters from, from people um, about that uh, since people, you know, since, I, since I've spent some time thinking, I'm known as having spent some time thinking about it. And um, people claim to solve the problem, uh, solve P is NP, P, P, the P versus NP problem by basically saying, you know, problems like Hamiltonian path, um, uh, you know, or these or, or other similar problems. Basically, there's clearly no way to solve them without searching uh, through a lot of possibilities. And then they go through a big long analysis showing that there are exponentially many uh, possibilities. Uh, the, um, the uh, you know, and, and a lot of the proofs that claim to solve P versus NP, they all look like that. You only, you only have to look some, somewhere in that paper, 
there's going to be a statement uh, along the lines to solve this problem, clearly you have to do it this way. Um, and that's the flaw in the reasoning because just like for the factoring problem, uh, just like for the uh, compositeness testing problem, you don't necessarily have to solve it use by, by searching for factors. There might be some other way to do it. You might be able to solve a Hamiltonian path problem without searching for Hamiltonian paths. There might be some other process that you can use which would uh, give you the answer. Um, so I, the class of polynomial time algorithms is very rich, can do many, many things. And I, and I, I wanted to present to you um, one of the most important polynomial time algorithms. And in a sense, it's kind of the, the, you can make a certain argument that this is sort of the, 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 in a sense, the most fundamental polynomial time algorithm. Some people might argue with me on that, but um, and that's a process called dynamic programming, which I, I'm sure some of you have seen already in your algorithms classes, and some of you may not have. But um, si since you have a homework problem on it, um, I, I want to uh, spend a little time describing it to you. And that's useful for solving this ACFG problem, um, which you may remember from the first half of the course uh, involving testing uh, if a grammar generates a string. Okay, so you remember this ACFG problem, you're given a grammar, context-free grammar, and, and a string, and I wanna know, is it in the language of the grammar? Okay, so that's gonna turn out to be solvable in polynomial time, but only with a kind of a clever algorithm. Uh, uh, remember it's decidable, we decided it by converting, by making sure that you are converting the grammar into Chomsky, Chomsky normal form. Then all the derivations have a certain length. You just try all the possible derivations of that length and you set, accept if any of those derivations generate W. Okay. Uh, you may remember that um, from the first half of the course. Um, that immediately gives an NP type algorithm for this language. Because basically, you non-deterministically, instead of trying them all sequentially, all of these derivations, you try them in parallel non-deterministically. So non-deterministically, you pick some derivation of that length, and you accept if it generates the input. This fits, this is a, classically fits our model of, of, uh, of NP. You can think of it as guessing the derivation and checking that it works, or in parallel writing down all possible derivations. Um, but this ACFG problem is a cl classically uh, an NP problem, a problem in, N in, the, in NP. Um, uh, and if you just imagine that, uh, so, and, the, and then what's going to be the, the certificate? If you found an input that's in the language, um, that's generated by the grammar, the certificate is a derivation. So if you look at it that way, you might think, well, that's the best you can do. This is gonna be an NP pro problem in NP and there's not gonna be a way of avoiding searching for the derivation, but that's not true. There is a way of avoiding searching for the derivation. You can kind of build up the derivation um, using dynamic program. And so that's what I wanted to kind of des describe for you, um, how that works. Also partly because it's a homework problem and I think Dynamic programming is, an, is a very important algorithm. Uh, so um, before we um, uh, describe what dynamic programming is, which is very simple, by the way, um, let's try to work up to it by making an attempt to solve this problem just using ordinary recursion. Um, so how would we solve the ACFG problem so you're given a grammar, you're given an input. Let's assume the grammar is in, conjunct in Chomsky normal form. Um, so um, that's gonna be useful. So it's a Chomsky normal form grammar and we wanna see how to uh, test if you can generate W. Um, and it's gonna be recursive algorithm. Yeah, recursive algorithm is going to actually solve sl something slightly more general. I'm gonna give you the grammar I'm gonna give you the string 
And I'm also gonna allow you to start at some other variable, variable besides the start variable. So I'm gonna give you a, some variable R and I know, I wanna know, can I generate W starting at R? Okay, so that's my slightly more general problem, which is gonna be useful in the recursion. Okay, so the input now to this, this algorithm is the grammar, the input, and the starting variable. And now how is the algorithm gonna work? It's gonna to try to test, can I get to, you know, is there some derivation pictured here as the parse tree for W starting at R? That's what the algorithm is trying to answer. Can I get W from R? The way it's gonna do that is it's gonna to try to divide W into the two strings in all possible ways, which sounds like it might be exponential, but it isn't. There's only a polynomial number of ways to divide the string into two substrings, um, just to order n, just depending on where you make that cut. So there's, only, there's you know, some, uh, so that's not too bad. There's a polynomial, there's only n ways of making that division. And also I'm gonna try every possible rule that comes from R um, that generates two, uh, um, that generates two variables. So these are what's allowed in Chomsky normal form. R goes to ST. Okay, so I'm gonna, for each possible way of cutting W into X, X, Y, and for each possible rule R goes to ST, I'm gonna see recursively, can I get uh, from S to X and from T to Y? So I'm gonna use my recursion now, now that I have smaller uh, um, strings instead of W, um, I, I can apply my recursion and try to answer it that way. And this algorithm will work. So if, they, if I found a way to cut W into X, Y, and I found a rule R goes to ST such that S generates X and T generates Y, then I'm good. I know I can generate uh, W from R, okay? And if there's no way of cutting W up um, to satisfy that, or, uh, you know, uh, if I can't find any way to, to, to divide W into X, Y and, and the rule R goes to X, T, which makes this work, if all possible ways fail, then you can't get from R to W. Okay, um, and then you can decide the original ACFG problem now by starting from the start variable instead of just some, any old R. You plug in the start variable for R. Okay, so if we, this algorithm works and it uh, can be used to solve ACFG, but the question is, is it polynomial? And it's not. Because um, every time you're doing the recursion, you're essentially adding another factor of n. Because here, as we pointed out, this is a factor of n, but that's happening every time you're doing a recursive level. And you can imagine, you know, I'm just doing a very crude analysis here, depending upon how you divide, divide w up, but roughly speaking, it's gonna get divided in half each time. So there's gonna be log n levels. And so that means you're gonna be multiplying n by itself log n times or get, give you an, an n to the log n algorithm. That's not polynomial because polynomial is n to the constant for some fixed constant. n to the log n is not gonna be polynomial. So this is not a polynomial algorithm. So instead, you're gonna to have to do something just a little bit more clever. Um, it's gonna be the same basic idea but just relying on one little observation. And the little observation is that when this non-polynomial implementation that I just described is actually pretty, pretty dumb because it's doing a lot of recomputation of things that it's already solved. Why is that? Because if you look at the number of possible different subproblems here, once I fix, once I give you G and, and I give you W, um, how many different subproblems uh, uh, G, S, and T are there? 
Um, well, the number of sub, the number of uh, of strings here, all of those strings are going to be substrings of W. There's only roughly n squared substrings of W. I'm always going to be generating in, in a subproblem here some substring of W from some starting variable um, in the grammar. So because there aren't that many different substrings and not that many different starting variables, the number, the total number of possible problems that this algorithm is going to be called on to solve is going to be in total a polynomial number of different subproblems. There aren't very many of them. There's only something like order n squared. So if the algorithm is running for exponentially long, long time, it's solving the same subproblem over and over again. That's dumb. Why don't you just remember when you solve the subproblem so you don't solve it again? Doing that enhanced recursion where you remember the, the, the problems you've already solved is called dynamic programming. I don't know why it's, it has such a, a confusing name like that. Uh, actually, it's called by several different things. But uh, anyway, that's known as dynamic programming. It's uh, recursion plus the memory. Um, and here is just repeating myself. Um, there are not very many different substrings. Um, so every time you're going to be in your recursion somewhere, you're going to be working with a substring. So there's not that many different subproblems that you can possibly solve. And just remember when you solve the subproblem and not solve it again. So I, let me just show you that algorithm uh, again here with the, with the little modification. So first of all, let me give you, this is the same algorithm from the previous slide. I'm just repeating it here without all the other stuff so we can just look at it directly, right? Dividing it into X and Y for each possible rule and just, and then recurse. Now, I'm gonna add a little step zero beforehand, um, which says, if I have G, W and R, let me just check first whether I've already solved that one before. So I have to keep track of the ones I've already solved. That's not too bad because there's only n squared order n squared possible different ones that I could be called on to solve. So I'm just gonna have a little table where I'm gonna remember those. And then every time I get a new one, I get, I get one to solve, I'll check, is it on that table? And what's the answer? So I won't have to rerun those. So now the total, I'm gonna be basically pruning that tree um, so that it has only a polynomial number of leaves. And so the total size of that tree now is gonna be polynomial. Um, uh, and so that's gonna yield a polynomial running time. This, by the way, I only learned this myself. I'm sure you guys all know this, who have taken this as in, the, in the algorithms course, course, has a special name called memoization, not memorization. So that this came from the same root, I think, but memoization, which is somehow remembering the results of a computation so you don't have to repeat it. Um, so the total number of calls is gonna be at most n squared to this algorithm uh, because you're never gonna be uh, redoing a work that you've done already. So, and, you know, and when you actually have to go through it, the, the, the running time um, uh, um, you know, so, so it's, it's the, the total amount of time that you're going to need is going to be polynomial altogether. Um, so let's hear, I don't remember what my check-in is on this. Um, oh yeah, so I mean, this is somehow related. And feel free to ask questions too while you're thinking about uh, this, um, this check-in. But the check-in says here, we've solved the ACFG problem in polynomial time. Does that tell us that every context-free language itself is also solvable in polynomial time. So just mull that over um, and please give me an answer to it. Uh, I hope you do better on this check-in than you did on the last one. Um, but anyway, why don't you go ahead and, and think about that. And I can take some questions in the meantime. Uh, Somebody's asking here, um, actually, I'm getting several questions on this. Um, why isn't it order n cubed or something greater than order n squared because of the variables? The variables are not, don't, don't depend on n. 
you know, when you're given, um, um, well, actually, that's not true. No, you, you're, you are right. Um, uh, because the grammar is part of the input. So that you might have as many as n different variables in the given grammar. So you, you, you are right. There is potentially, um, you know, the, the grammar might be half the size of the input and the input to the grammar w might be half the size of the input. So I didn't think about that, but you're correct. There, there are uh, potentially uh, different numbers of variables in different grammars. So you have to add an extra factor, which would be at most the size of the input because that's as many variables as you could possibly have. So it really should be, I think, um, order n cubed um, to take that into account as well. Plus all of the work that needs to happen in terms of dividing things up. You know, on a one tape Turing machine, there's gonna be some extra work uh, just to carry out some of these individual steps um, because with a single tape, things are sometimes a little awkward. I think the total running time is gonna be end up being something like n to the fourth or n to the fifth on a one tape Turing machine. Um, uh, but, um, but that's a good point. Um, so somebody's saying, how can we be storing n squared strings in finite time? I'm not saying wh why finite time? We have polynomial time. Every, every sta sta stage of this algorithm is allowed to run for polynomially many steps. As long as it's clearly polynomial, we can just write that down as a single stage. Um, And then part two should say, oh, there's a typo here. So use D. Thank you. That is that is a typo. Uh, uh, I'm afraid if I change it on my original slide here, things will break in some horrible way. Let's just see. Did I completely wreck my slide? No, that's good. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Um, uh, oops. Okay, how's, how's our check-in doing? Okay, I think you're just about all done. Um, oh, that's still spent a lot of time on this. And polling. Um, as you may remember from the first half of the course, so the answer is, is A indeed. Um, Remember that we showed ACFG is in is decidable, and therefore each context-free language itself is decidable, just because you can then plug, you can plug in the, a specific grammar into the ACFG problem. The very same reasoning works here. Um, so you can, for, if, if you have a context-free language, it has a grammar, you can plug that grammar into the ACFG problem, and then that's polynomial time. You'll get, a, you're gonna get a polynomial time algorithm for that, uh, for that language. Um, so good to review that. Um, it's, it's the same thing from same argument we used before. Um, okay. Also, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. There are, there's another way of looking at dynamic programming. We'll talk about this again um, in maybe in a lecture, probably next lecture, just because I know you have a homework problem on it. And um, if you've seen dynamic programming before, it's going to be easy. If you haven't seen it before, it's going to be, I think, pro probably a little challenging. Um, but uh, another way of looking at dynamic programming is the so-called bottom-up version of dynamic programming. And what that would mean is you solve all of the subproblems first before you solve all the smaller subproblems before you solve the larger subproblems. Um, let me just, you know, I, I, it's here on the slide. I'm not sure I want to talk it through, but basically um, you solve the, the subproblems here where um, the, the strings are, start with strings of length one. And then you, from that, you build up to subproblems where the substrings are of length two and then three and so on. And each of those only re relies on the smaller previously solved subproblems. So you can it, kind of in a systematic way, solve all the larger and larger subproblems, uh, you know, for larger and larger substrings. And um, that gives a kind of a different perspective on dynamic programming. And kind of for different problems, sometimes it's better to think about 
either this sort of top-down recursion-based process or the sort of the bottom-up uh, process that I'm describing here. Um, they're really completely equivalent, um, but uh, you know the the version that's described for this particular algorithm, which appears in the textbook, is actually the bottom up algorithm. Um, so you shouldn't be confused if you see something there which looks somewhat different. Um, uh, and that's often you see so you basically solve all possible subproblems, filling out basically filling out a table. Um, let me not say it any more. Uh, uh, say anything more about that uh, here since we're running a little short on time. Um, but um, there are really two perspectives on dynamic program. Um, okay, so moving on from there, um, uh, let's, let, let's shift gears, uh, leave context-free languages and uh, dynamic programming behind um, and start moving toward understanding um, P and NP. And for that, we will um, uh, introduce a new problem called the satisfiability problem. And that's one we're going to spend a lot of time on. So important to, if you tuned out a little bit during the dynamic programming discussion, time to get back on board. Um, so the satisfiability problem is going to be a computational problem um, uh, that we're going to be working on. And it has to do with the Boolean formula. So these are like expressions, like arithmetical formula, like uh, x plus y times z. But instead of using um, uh, numerical uh, variables, we're going to be using Boolean va variables that take on Boolean values true, false, or sometimes represented by 1 and 0. Um, and the operators that we're going to be using are going to be the and, or, and negation operations, and, or, and not. Okay. Um, and we're going to say such a very, uh, such a formula, uh, such a Boolean formula, we're going to call it satisfiable. We'll do an example in a second. If that formula value evaluates to true, um, if you assign, make some assignment of values to its variables. So just like arithmetical formula will have some value if you plug in values for the uh, variables, Boolean formula is gonna have some value if you plug in Boolean values for its variables. And I wanna know, is there some way to plug in values which makes the whole thing evaluate to true? So the formula is going, itself is gonna evaluate to some either true or false. And I want it to evaluate to true. Um, so, uh, here is our example. Let's take the formula phi, which is x or y, and x complement, you know, or not x or not y. So the notation x with a bar over it, x, uh, x complement is just x bar, not, not x. Is uh, just a, a, the way, if you're familiar with the other notation uh, for the, the not operation, which just inverts ones and zeros, um, we, we would write it, we're gonna write it with a bar instead of the, the negation symbol. So I, I'm assuming that you've all seen Boolean algebra, Boolean arithmetic before, you know, where, you know, the and operation is only true if both inputs are true. So these are gonna be binary and operations and binary or operations, um, or is gonna be true if either input is true and not as true if it's single input is false. So it just flips the answer. Okay, so here I wanna know for this formula, for this Boolean formula here, is it satisfiable? Is there some way to assign values to the variables to make this formula evaluate to true? So for example, let's just try things. Let's make X and Y both true. So X is true and Y is true. So x or y, well, that's good, that's true. But now we have to do an and, so we need both sides to be true. So now, now we have x complement. Well, we said, we said x is true, so x complement is false. y complement is false. False or false is false. So now we have a true and false. That's going to be false. We did not find a satisfying assignment. But maybe there's another one. And in fact, there is. 
if you make x true and y false, then both of these parts will be evaluate the true, and then you'll have true and true. So we found a satisfying assignment to this formula. It is in fact uh, satisfiable. So if you say x is one and y is zero, yes, this is satisfiable. Now the problem of testing for a Boolean formula, if it is satisfiable, is going to be the SAT language. It's a set. It's a collection of satisfiable Boolean formula. And testing whether you're in SAT or not is going to be a uh, an important computational problem. Um, and there was a, a, an amazing um, theorem, uh, which really got this whole subject going, and, uh, discovered independently by uh, Steve Cook in North America and Leonid Levin in the, in the former Soviet Union, almost exactly at the same time, which made a connection between this one problem and all of the problems in NP. So by solving this one satisfiability problem, in polynomial time, you you there it 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 allows you to solve all of the problems in NP in polynomial time. So if you could solve this problem sat in 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 P, then Hamiltonian path is also solvable in P. It's kind of you know uh, you step back and think about that. It's kind of amazing. Um, and the method that we're gonna introduce is called polynomial time reducibility. Um, and let's do a quick check-in on this. This should be an easy one. Um, why don't you just think about, is SAT, the SAT problem that we just described there, is that in NP? Three seconds. You all there? Okay, ending polling. Um, yeah. So the, hopefully you're getting the intuition for NP uh, that these are the problems. To be an NP means that when you're a member of the language, there's a short proof or a short certificate uh, of membership. And in this case, the short certificate that the formula is satisfiable is the assignment, which makes it true, also called the satisfying assignment. So yes, this is an NP language, a language that's in NP. Um, uh, so there are a lot of things that we don't know in this subject, but this isn't one of them. We do know that SAT is an NP. Uh, so let's talk about our method um, for showing this uh, remarkable fact that if you can solve poly if you can solve um, uh, uh, if you can solve SAT in polynomial time, then all of NP is solvable in polynomial time. And it uses this notion of polynomial time reducibility, which is just like mapping reducibility that I hope you've all grown to know and love in the first half of the course. But now the reduction has to operate in polynomial time. So it's the same picture that we had before, mapping A, a to B, transforming A questions to B questions, but the, now the transformation has to operate quickly. And we get that if A is polynomial time reducible to B and B is polynomial time, then A is also polynomial time. Same pattern as before. If A is reducible to B and B is easy, then A is easy. Um, and here is kind of the essence of the idea, or, or, or at least the outline in a sense, the, the idea of, of this Cook and Levin theorem, that if satisfiability is in P, then everything in NP can be done in P which is because we will show that all problems in NP are polynomial time reducible to set. That's the amazing fact. So therefore, if you can bring sat down into P by using this reduction, it brings everything else along with it because everything is reducible to set. So we just have to show how to do that. And there is an analogy that we had in the first half of the course in one of our homework problems, if you may remember. We showed that ATM has the very special property that all Turing recognizable languages are mapping reducible to it. I think that was problem two on or two A, either in this problem set three or problem set two. 
uh, I think problem set three, um, that every, every Turing recognizable language is, is polynomial time reducible to ATM. And so very similar picture. And there's a lot of analogies here that you can draw be between uh, the computability section and the complexity section. Anyway, with that, I know we're, we're just about out of time. So let's quick review um, of what we've done um, here. And um, I will stick around for uh, questions for a while. Is there a, okay, that's a good question. Is there kind of a, you know, a um, sort of a regular reduction analogy version to mapping reducibility? You know, we had the, we had the general reduction uh, for the computability section. And we had the mapping reduction to the computability section here. We're only gonna be focusing now on the mapping redu re reduction. So polynomial time reduction is by assumption gonna be a mapping reduction. Yes, there is a general polynomial time reduction notion as well. Um, if you, you know, this is not required, but if you are curious about the general reduction and how to precisely formulate that. It's actually appears in uh, chapter six under Turing reducibility. Um, that's the general notion of reducibility spelled out in a formal way. And there's polynomial time Turing reducibility as well. We're not gonna talk about it this, uh, in this course. Um, other questions? Does NP correspond exactly to verification in polynomial time? If, well, we have to, for, for me to answer that as a precise question, we have to have a precise definition of verification, but with the right uh, definition, the answer is yes. Um, so you can define a verifier uh, as a polynomial time algorithm um, that gives a certificate, given uh, that takes a certificate and an input to the language and will, um, you know, accept if there if that certificate is a valid certificate for that input. Um, this is actually discussed in chapter, I think nine um, of the text. Uh, but um, uh, you, um, no, I'm forgetting already what's where in the book. But yeah, you can think of it. You can think of NP in terms of verification as a definition. Uh, is proving P equal NP the same as proving that a poem, you know, actually I can even make the, if you want, you can post public comments too as well. I should have done that in other cases. If is proving P equal NP the same as proving that a polynomial time non-deterministic Turing machine N has a polynomial time deterministic Yeah, so it does it mean that, suppose we prove that P equals NP, which is the minority view, I would say uh, quite uh, the small minority view that that, uh, there are some people who believe that that, 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 that is uh, entirely possible and might, might even be the case, but that's a very small, small group. Um, but yeah, if you proved P equal NP, that's the same as saying that every non-deterministic polynomial time Turing machine is gonna have a companion deterministic polynomial time Turing machine, which does the same language. That's exactly what it means. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>